to the help. I'm an accidental government information librarian webinar series or help for short. Uh, this series is brought to you by the American Library Association's Government Documents Roundtable, and thank you all so much for coming. You will all be muted during our webinar, but we encourage you to participate in chat and in the Q&A. And if you don't see either of those icons on your screen, you can check right along the bottom of your screen and you'll find those icons there. We encourage you to add questions via the Q&A throughout today's sessions, and we'll be holding questions until the end. Uh, and But that said, we encourage you to submit them as you think of them. Um, if you have any technical issues throughout today's webinar, Kelly Wilson is on hand to help. You can feel free to chat directly with her. But worst case scenario, do remember that this webinar is being recorded as we were just reminded as the recording started. Um, be sure to stay tuned for our spring slate of webinars. In March, we'll be co-hosting a session on elections data with the politics, policy, and international relations section, uh, dates forthcoming. And if you have any topics you would like to present, please let me know. There will also be a short survey at the end of today's webinar where you can share your thoughts and feedback and even ideas for future webinars. Um, you can see more of our past webinars on our YouTube channel. Please give us a follow if you are a YouTube user and don't forget to subscribe and hit that notification bell so that you know when new webinars are up. So let's move on to talking about today's webinar. Today's webinar is States of LGBTQ Equality, Examining the Patchwork of Policies and How Librarians Can Support LGBTQ Community Members. And our speaker today is Logan Casey. Based in St. Louis, Logan is the Senior Policy Researcher and Advisor at the Movement Advancement Project. He creates accessible and persuasive policy research and resources, manages all policy-related data, including the LGBTQ equality maps, tracking state and local progress, and leads MAPS movement capacity research. Prior to joining MAP, Logan was a research associate for the Harvard Opinion Research Project, where he was the deputy researcher on a polling series about discrimination in America, among other projects. He earned his PhD in political science from in 2016 from the University of Michigan, Ann Arbor, where his research focused on the influence of emotions in public opinion toward LGBTQ people and issues. I'm going to go ahead and stop my screen share here and let Logan take it away. Thank you for joining us. Hi, thank you, Larry, and thank you everyone for being here. I am delighted to get to talk to y'all. Uh, librarians are some of my favorite people, uh, so I'm especially excited to be here. Um, and thank you for the opportunity. So as Larry already mentioned, um, this is the title of the presentation today, States of LGBTQ Equality. We'll talk about patchwork of policies and how y'all can support LGBTQ community members. And uh, as again was already mentioned, my name is Logan. I use he, him pronouns, and I am MAP's senior policy researcher and advisor. My email is on the screen. It's logan at lgbtmap.org. I'm here to be a resource if I can. Um, also, I'm looking at this and now realizing I need to get a new picture that was uh, post-COVID uh, to be young again. Um, so anyway, here about MAP, we are an independent nonprofit think tank. We've been around since 2006, and our mission is to speed equality for all people, including LGBTQ people. And we do that through a few ways. Uh, first is advancing the conversation through messaging research, communication tools, technical assistance. We work a lot with media uh, and many other organizations to really change the way that we talk about LGBTQ people and issues. And I'm gonna mention some of these resources and you know this about map because there are a lot of different resources we have that I think could be of interest or, or help to y'all in the work that you do, not just about identity documents, but just in general, anything about LGBTQ folks, we probably have something for you. Um, so here's uh, advancing the conversation and messaging and media work. We also work in policy. That's my job, advancing policy by creating resources that are easily understandable, persuasive, actionable. And we'll talk a lot about these resources today. We also emphasize and, and care a great deal about advancing collaboration, both within the LGBTQ movement and across many movements and, and types of work. Uh, we work to build coalitions and partnerships, including through events just like this one, to help empower and support other organizations doing the work that they're doing, and to help bring a build a broad base of support for LGBTQ people and issues. And specifically about policy work, again, we'll we'll go into a, several examples of the kind of work we do today. But I just want to mention that we have a wealth of resources. However, you might be looking for them. If it's uh, population-based resources, you're looking for information about specific 
groups within the LGBTQ community or uh, specific issues that affect the LGBTQ community. We have tons of resources. Um, so all of this is to say, email me if I can be a resource and uh, I'm really looking forward to talking to you today. So here's what we're actually gonna be talking about today. Um, first, we'll start with the current policy landscape and this will be just a very brief or uh, very broad overview of major issues facing LGBTQ people today, including some that directly impact libraries and schools. And then we'll talk about uh, a brief overview of MAPS Equality Maps and our related resources, because this will be uh, a, a major, hopefully a majorly helpful tool for the work that y'all are doing. And it will also help me talk to you about identity document laws and policies, which is uh, one of the main focuses of today. And then throughout the presentation, we'll talk about how librarians can support LGBTQ community members. So we'll start with the current policy landscape. <clears throat> and the first thing I wanna say is that, of course, there's been a great deal of progress for LGBTQ folks and our experiences over recent years and decades, um, but progress is not linear. And we are currently uh, in a very clear period of efforts to undermine LGBTQ equality and roll back the progress that has been made to date. So you may have seen recent headlines like these on the screen, more anti-LGBTQ laws passed in the last year than any year in history, a state of crisis, an unprecedented wave. Um, and we expect these trends to continue. And I wanna say that these headlines aren't just hyperbole, they are in fact uh, factual. So this is research from our friends at the Equality Federation who I'll talk about later, they're a wonderful organization uh, and the human rights campaign. And every year they do an analysis of bills that have been introduced in state legislatures across the country that affect LGBTQ people. And the red dotted line that you see on the screen is the number of bad or anti LGBTQ bills that have been introduced in state legislatures every year since 2010. And you can see all the way to the right that that red dotted line is the highest it's ever been uh, so last year was a record high number of anti-LGBTQ bills that were introduced in state legislatures with nearly 270 bills introduced. And you see right below that, it was also a record high number of bad bills that actually became law. So, you know, we often hear stories uh, that, you know, <laughs> things are on the up and up, public opinion is more supportive than ever, marriage was legalized, like things are doing really well. And again, of course, there's been a great deal of progress made, but you know, the facts of the matter are that we're also seeing a great deal of resistance and pushback and backlash and very coordinated efforts to undermine the progress that has been made so far and to halt any further um, progress, not just for LGBTQ people, but for people of color and racial equity, uh, matters of racial equity and a lot more. So uh, we're in this moment of progress being under attack. And I also want to note here that it's not just that bad bills are being introduced at high and passed at higher rates, but also this purple line shows the number of good bills that have been introduced over the last 11 or so years. And this shows that actually last year was the second lowest number of good bills that have been introduced uh, over this time frame. And good bills here, I mean things that would protect or affirm LGBTQ people's rights, things like inclusive non-discrimination protections, or like what we'll talk about today, bills that could improve the process for changing your name or your gender marker on identity documents and lots of other kinds of issues. So uh, both a mark remarkable increase in hostile discriminatory legislation and a noticeable decrease in good affirmative protective legislation. And uh, let's so let's talk about what specifically, sorry, what specifically the kinds of bills are that we're seeing lately. Uh, one of the major issues, if not the biggest issue right now in the LGBTQ space and, and possibly even more broadly is, is not COVID. Uh, it's not many of the other pressing matters we're facing as a country, but rather uh, talking about what teachers can and can't talk about in the classroom and what's going on in schools. So you've probably heard a great deal about um, bills that would propose to ban or censor discussions of race in the classroom, or critical race theory. Uh, those often also talk about sex and other matters of power and identity. So those bills have been rapidly spreading across the country in the last year or two. And many bills in the in state legislatures are also targeting LGBTQ issues explicitly, everything from 
uh, what rules you can and can't put on teachers and staff with respect to respecting students' pronouns, what textbooks you can and can't use, how trans ki transgender kids uh, can move through their life at school, whether that's in sports or the bathrooms or many other things. So lots and lots of focus on uh, L matters of LGBTQ people and race in schools in particular. And I wanna emphasize that a lot of this is playing out over questions of books and curricular materials, uh, instructional materials. And I'm sure to folks on this call, that's no surprise. That's a big pattern of history that we're seeing repeat, um, but a big focus in state legislatures, especially this year on uh, school books, um, this headline in the middle here is a, 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 so this isn't even a state legislative level, but also the local level, a mayor in Mississippi withholding uh, taxpayer money from a public library, not just a school library, but a public library over their LGBTQ related books uh, on the shelves. And here in my home state of Missouri, a bill was introduced last year, and we expect similar ones this year, that would create a parental advisory board uh, over public libraries and that board could basically remove any material that it deems quote unquote sexually inappropriate or explicit with no oversight whatsoever, even uh, creating a provision that librarians could be jailed if they fail to uh, comply with the decisions of the public library of the parental overview board. So luckily that bill didn't pass last year, but these are the types of things that are being debated and they're all very much centered around questions of race and LGBTQ identity. So this is a, a major area for the policy landscape right now. And I'm gonna give you an example of one of our equality maps that tracks uh, different kinds of laws and policies around the country and focus just on these school laws to give you an example of laws that are already on the books. And then I'll show you states that are actively considering more laws like this in the legislature. So this is an equality map that we have on LGBTQ curricular laws, as you can see across the top. And what you see here is actually three different policies all within the sort of curricular bucket. And the dark green states, there are seven of them right now that have passed state laws that explicitly require that the state's curricular standards, so not the lesson plans themselves, but the, the standards that uh, learning outcomes must reach uh, in the state, those curricular standards must be LGBTQ inclusive as is appropriate to the subject material, like whether it's in history or science, making sure that it's relevant to that subject and also appropriate to the age level. And so these are states that have taken good and proactive measures to make sure that the curriculum and the learning materials that students are engaging with is representative of the whole country and the diversity of human experience, but is also historically accurate and reflects LGBTQ folks alongside other communities. And I wanna note also importantly that these inclusive curricular standard laws tend to include requirements that curricula must also be inclusive of other communities like people with disabilities or communities of color. So these are great bills that are, are good and doing good work here. Um, but in this same area of law, we have these two other, at least two other policies. This map is just showing these for now, but there are other curricular related policies. Um, the lighter orange ones are states that are saying so this is Arizona, Montana, Arkansas, Tennessee, and Florida, states that are saying, uh, if you're gonna talk about LGBTQ people or issues in the classroom, you're required to notify parents about that ahead of time. And the parents are allowed to remove their children from those classrooms. Uh, so that, that obviously, so we call those parental opt-out bills for short, um, but that obviously has the effect of putting additional, well, many effects, including putting additional burdens on teachers to. Uh, be able to, you know, have the time when they're already under-resourced uh, and understaffed to send out those sort of notifications ahead of time. And then if students are opting out of the, if the parents are opting their students out of class, um, the obligation and additional burdens of creating a, alternative resources or alternative lesson plans and that sort of thing. But it also creates this broader environmental effect of saying, you know, these are taboo subjects, maybe we won't talk about them, maybe we will. Uh, and the impacts that that has on the school climate in terms of normalizing or stigmatizing certain topics like LGBTQ people in our experiences. Um, and these also have, they, they have a broader chilling effect of knowing that those are the sorts of things that can play out, including the fact that some of these laws allow for parents to sue schools 
or teachers if those provisions aren't followed, it ends up having a chilling effect on many teachers uh, lesson plans where they just won't talk about the issues at all to avoid even the, the threat of uh, potential mishaps. So um, those parental opt-out laws are already on the books in five states. And then the darker orange four states, Texas, Oklahoma, Louisiana, and Mississippi are all states that extend that a step further and say, actually, you know what? You just can't talk about LGBTQ issues at all. Not even a question of uh, parental notification, but you just can't talk about them at all. Uh, so those sort of like censorship bans. So here's one example of one of our equality maps, but also laws that are already on the books related to this super salient political issue today. And this map now is states that are actively considering at this moment bills similar to the ones I just showed you, the, the bad ones anyway, the opt-out bills, the explicit censorship bills about LGBTQ people and issues, uh, but also bills that would focus more narrowly but still problematically on books, textbooks, school libraries, public libraries, as well as the bans that we talked about with prohibiting discussions about race and sex and power and other questions of identity in the classroom. And I wanna emphasize that this map, I just, just pulled this together today. Uh, this is, um, so this is only the bills that I'm aware of, so I might actually be missing some and some state legislative sessions haven't even started yet. So we certainly expect more states to show up on this map. So you can see, just from here, how many different states are currently considering these bills, and that doesn't even show you states that considered them last year. So it's a really salient issue, unfortunately. Um, but I want to take a minute and zoom out from that. So if what we just talked about is the current moment of progress being under attack, this really salient issue or set of issues around schools and classrooms, I want to talk about how this legislative environment or this current moment isn't happening in isolation. There's this pre-existing policy landscape for LGBTQ issues that can help us better understand what's happening, both in those legislatures and for LGBTQ people's daily lives, whether we're thinking about politicians or not. And that broader context is this patchwork of protections that I uh, mentioned in the title and, and have talked about once or twice already. And so what I mean there is that, you know, there are many, many issues affecting LGBTQ people's lives, not just the school issues, although that's obviously big and important, but there are many, many issues uh, that affect LGBTQ people's lives. And this list on the screen is just some of them. These are uh, most of the issues that we currently track at MAP on our quality maps. And so just, you don't need to read this, but I'm just trying to give you the visual impression of like, there are many, many issues that continue to affect our lives. Um, and thinking about these individually or trying to add them all up and get a big picture can, be, can get overwhelming pretty quickly. So what we do at MAP is we go through every single one of these policy issues, see how states are treating that policy differently and give every state a score for each one of these issues. And then from there, we're able to look at a state and add up their score for all the different policies and create a sort of summary map. So the map I just showed you was of a couple different policy areas. We then add those scores up across all of the 50 plus laws and policies we track and we're able to create this bird's eye view of what is the legislative environment or the policy landscape for LGBTQ issues at the state level across all 50 plus of those policies. So that's what you're looking at here. So what you see is uh, there are nine states currently, those are the red states that have a negative overall score. So those are states that are, they're not only doing poorly, they're, they actually have an, a literal negative score on our on our policy tally scoring system. And that's generally because states like these have uh, not only a lack of positive protections like non-discrimination law, but they have actively discriminatory and harmful laws like HIV criminalization laws uh, or laws like we'll talk about today that make it really difficult, if not impossible, for people to update the name or gender marker on their ID documents. Moving up from there, uh, states like my home state of Missouri uh, are in the orange or low overall policy tally. So they're, they're not negative, but they're still not doing great either. And then as you can imagine, moving up into fair, medium and high. Um, so you, what you see here is that there's a lot of variation across states and even across regions or within regions. So you know the South, uh, a lot more red and orange than in the Northeast or the West. Uh, but even within a region like the Midwest, a lot of variation ranging from South Dakota as a negative state all the way through 
uh, Minnesota and Illinois at these more high quality states. So a lot of variation here, and I'll talk for a in a minute about why that variation matters. Um, but I wanna also pause and say, you know, LGBTQ policy, quote unquote, isn't just that you know, one big category. We're talking about lots of different types of policies and lots of different people within the LGBTQ community. So one of the things that we're also able to do with our equality maps is to break out the sexual orientation aspects of these laws from the gender identity aspects of these laws. And that can help give us a, a better understanding of how LGBTQ policy is playing out in different ways. So if we look just at the sexual orientation aspects of law, this map actually looks a little bit better than what we were just looking at. You see there's fewer negative or red states, more of those states in the middle, those like cream colored states and more of the green states. So sexual orientation law in general doing a little bit better uh, but you, there's still, as you can see, quite a lot of variation from one state to the next. But on the flip side, for gender identity, uh, a much starker picture. So you can see lots more states in the red not doing well on gender identity law. And there are a number of reasons for this that we could talk about in Q&A, but one of the short answers is that, if nothing else, um, both politicians and the public have been thinking about uh, sexual orientation issues uh, and, you know, those attitudes have changed a lot more quickly than uh, attitudes have regarding gender identity and transgender people. And we're also seeing that play out, not just with respect to how much change has happened so far in public attitudes, but also what state legislatures are actively uh, legislating about right now. Many of the policies being proposed in state legislatures are explicitly targeting transgender people and in a way that would actually worsen their score on this map. Um, so uh, a focus here on, on trans people in particular right now. Um, but I mentioned a, a second ago that it's, there's this policy variation matters, right? And it's not just a question of, isn't this a, a pretty map or isn't that interesting? Uh, look what we can do with, with Adobe. <laughs> like there's, there's actual reasons that this policy variation matters. Um, there's a great deal of research that shows that state policy variation uh, has a big impact on any number of things, both for individuals and for the state itself. So some of that research shows things like economic security, that LGBTQ people living in states with higher scores or better uh, LGBTQ related laws and policies in general, those folks are doing better economically. Uh, and furthermore, that the state is doing better economically, that having good and inclusive laws is good for the economy. Uh, we similarly see research that shows, um, sorry, my screen is dragging a little bit. Uh, similarly, I have a lot of research that shows that LGBTQ related laws and policies are strongly correlated to uh, mental and physical health outcomes for both adults and children. And I wanna pause and say for a second, I don't think that these arguments are, are big stretches, right? Like if you pass a law about healthcare, making healthcare more affordable, easier to access, we should expect hopefully that down the road, uh, people in that state, their health outcomes will be better, right? So this is all we're arguing here is that policy matters for people's lives and research shows that it does. Um, and that's true even when it's a policy that you might not think is directly related. So laws like identity document laws and policies, which we might not think of as a health issue, even though it is, when those laws are better, uh, health outcomes are better for trans people in those states. So there's a ton of research about this and I'm happy to share more, um, but just for the sake of time, I'll keep moving. And similar impacts in the research from the research show that uh, state policy variation also matters for kids, academic achievement and their health as well, and a whole lot more. So this policy variation is important um, for all of these reasons, as well as the fact that it's just difficult to navigate, right? So if you're a person, so like me, I, so I'm transgender. I was living in Ohio until a couple months ago, and I just moved back home to Missouri. And you know, I even as the policy researcher on this on this issue <laughs> on these questions, it's still hard to know, okay, what are the rules about, or what protections do I have in this state versus this state? Or if I'm going on a road trip from here to there, um, what things do I need to think about and make sure that I'm prepared for just in case something happens? So this variation is, has all these relevant um, 
impacts on people's lived material lives and experiences. And it's also just something that's difficult to navigate by itself. And I think this is one of the many places that uh, librarians can be super supportive and, and help folks navigate this variation. So with that said, let's talk about our quality maps uh, and the resources. I think that'll help me. Uh, I'll, well, I'll be drawing a lot on these resources to talk about identity document laws and policies. So I'll give you a quick run, run through of what they are and how to use them. And then we'll talk about identity documents in detail. <clears throat> so first, I, I think I've mentioned this already. Our equality maps are currently tracking over 50 LGBTQ related laws and policies at the state and a few at the local level, <clears throat> excuse me. And these maps, uh, we update them in real time. So as soon as we hear about a change or a law that's passed um, and we can verify that, I update the maps right away. So not only are they uh, comprehensive tracking 50 plus policies, but they're also as up to date as possible. Um, we also provide citations and more information for every single one of the maps. Uh, we try to be very rigorous in the research, but also extremely transparent in the work that we're doing. One, so that folks don't have to reinvent the wheel. And two, so that if you're coming to our maps to try to figure out what do I have to do in this state or what are my rights and protections in this state, there's more information available to you to get what you need if we don't have the level of detail that you're looking for. Um, the link on the page is, uh, so we have a Medium blog where we talk about the work we do, but one of those blog posts is tips and tricks for how to navigate our quality maps. And I think that could be helpful. So this is a direct link to that blog post, but we'll talk about some of this right now. Um, we also, from these maps, we're able to compile a state profile for every state. So we have, uh, if the first bullet is maps, like one that you already saw on LGBTQ curricular laws, you have a map for each one of those policies. We also have a profile for each and every state that summarizes how that state is doing on all of the policies that we're scoring. And I do wanna mention, uh, we just recently expanded our offerings into a new set of what we're calling democracy maps. And this might be of interest for your event next month about uh, election data. Um, but we, so if the equality maps are 50 plus LGBTQ related laws, the democracy maps are uh, almost similar number of uh, maps about election and voting related laws and policies. So. I won't talk about that today, but we do have that resource as well. So to get to our quality maps, you start by going to our website, lgbtmap.org. And at the top, you'll see these different um, buttons. There's democracy maps right there, and then equality maps right here. So if you click on that, it'll take you to this landing page. This map is the one that I just showed you of the, the big picture state policy variation across all the policies we track. Uh, and then these tabs right here, so I'm not sure if you can see my cursor, but uh, the tabs right here, sexual orientation and gender identity, those are those two follow-up maps that I showed you, splitting out the sexual orientation and gender identity policies separately. Um, you can also get directly to this page by just typing in lgbtmap.org slash equality dash maps. Um, and then once you're at this page, you can either hover over the equality maps button again at the top or click on either of these choose a state or choose an issue uh, buttons that are in a red circle here. And that'll give you a uh, direct access to these lists of all the different policies we track. And this screen grab doesn't even get the whole list, but just so that you could see some of it without it being too small. So if you click on choose an issue, it'll give you this list of all of the different maps that we have available. And they're sorted here. The default is sorting by category. So relationship issues, parental recognition, non-discrimination law, um, LGBTQ youth, healthcare, criminal justice. And what you don't see on here is also religious exemptions and identity document laws. You can also sort these alphabetically and that'll get you to that list we saw earlier. Um, and then if you click on any one of those uh, entries, it'll take you directly to the map for that policy area. So the, here's the one that we saw earlier about curricular laws. And I wanna emphasize what I, said a few minutes ago about citations and more information available. If we actually were to go to the website for this map or the URL for this map, there would be a bunch of explanatory text above the map and more information below the map. Um, I've just been showing you the map itself for the sake of not throwing a wall of text at you, but there's more information on each maps page. And importantly, this um, read the state by state statutes button uh, will give you a PDF link of 
basically all the information that's on the map itself, but with additional info and links to the legislation or the, um, the statute or the administrative law or whatever it might be. Uh, and I wanna note that for some of our maps, that statutes button is below the legend. For others, like this one, you can see it's here below the map, or the lower left corner of the map. I'm sorry that those are inconsistent. We're working on streamlining those right now, but I did just wanna point out that sometimes they're in different places, um, but there is one for every single map that we have, and it'll give you a PDF that looks like this. And this particular example is, a fairly recent area of loss. There's not a lot of information for me to report here, but in other areas of law where there's a lot more going on, or there might be, you know, executive orders and a piece of legislation and some administrative code or regulatory something, I try to put as much information as I can in here so that you can get all the information you might need. Um, okay, so those are the citation sheets. And as I mentioned, we also have these state profiles. So if you are on any one of our maps and you just click directly on the state, it'll take you to that state's profile. So here's Wisconsin state profile, for example. We start off with uh, demographic quick facts about the LGBTQ population in the state. Each one of those quick facts is also cited. That's the language below it. So Williams 2020. And if this weren't just a picture, you would see that this is um, those are hyperlinked as well, and will take you directly to the source of that data. And then it goes on, the state profile goes on to the sort of summary statistics of how that state is doing on our scoring system, both overall and then broken out by sexual orientation and gender identity scores. And as you scroll down through the state profile, you'll see a detailed table breaking out that state's score for each and every one of the policies that we score. So here's an example of the relationship laws. And these state profiles, again, are, are interactive. So if you were to click on any one of these rows, it would take you directly to that map so that you could, oh, what is second, what does that mean, second parent adoption? And you could click on it and it would take you directly to that map. And then you could click on the state again to come right back to where you were. So they're meant to be really interactive and hopefully helpful and easy to use. If you ever have an issue, with the website or something's not working or it's not clear, you can just send me an email and I will you know, either get you the information you need or fix the issue. And that's how we've improved our website a lot over the years is by people just telling us like, I don't, can you, can you make this functionality work better? Or, that's not working or that's not clear. So we very much welcome um, feedback and, and requests like that. Um, oh, and if you keep scrolling down the state profiles, you'll start to see some of our local level tracking as well. So we track non-discrimination ordinances and conversion therapy bans at the local level too. So at the bottom of the state profile, once you get past all the state level laws, you'll see the local level tracking. And this is a, Wisconsin's an interesting example because they have sexual orientation, non-discrimination law at the state level, but not gender identity law at the state level. Um, so we are tracking local level non-discrimination ordinances that include gender identity protections. So you can, you know, we have these for every state that um, does not have state level protections because if they have state level, it looks like this one on the left where the whole state's covered. Um, so you can see there where in the state there are inclusive protections for gender identity or, or whatever is needed. And if you keep scrolling, past the map, you also get this handy table of what those different localities are that have those provisions and um, what is included in each ones because sometimes they're really different from one another. So it can get pretty detailed. We intend this to be uh, as accurate as possible. So again, if there's ever errors or something you see, like maybe you're in Wisconsin right now and you know that I'm missing something, I wanna know. Um, so please, please let me know. Um, okay, so that's that's a brief 101 on the equality maps. Again, here's how you can get there. This tiny URL is for the tips and tricks. And again, my email is logan at lgbtmap.org if I can help with anything or if you see any problems. So that's a quick overview on how to use them. And so now we're going to use them to talk about and navigate identity document laws and policies specifically. Okay, so the first thing I want to say about identity document laws is that while we're going to talk about these in the context of transgender people in particular, um, identity docs are about everybody. Uh, they are a key part of identity, of everyday life, rather. So 
And by identity documents, I mean things like a driver's license or a birth certificate, these sort of state or government issued ID cards. Um, sorry, my cat wants to join the conversation. Um, so these, I, these identity docs are a key part of everyday life. And I, they've become so commonplace in our life that I, I think many of us don't even notice how important they are uh, until maybe you lose your ID or there's a big obstacle to you getting one or updating it. Um, they, identity documents are, are vital keys that are necessary to open the doors to everything from you know, driving a car to getting a library card uh, or opening a bank account or applying for an apartment. Um, but sorry, my, I'm gonna just escort my cat out of the room, sorry. <laughs> oh goodness, Zoom era life. Sorry, thanks for understanding. <laughs> I'll just say this is an audience where cats are definitely welcome on Zoom. <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't normally wouldn't mind her staying, but I have a feeling she'd, um, hey, excuse you. I have a feeling <laughs> she would advance the slides before mm. I'm ready to talk about them. Is this just how this is gonna be? Okay. All right, well, anyway, identity documents are important. <laughs> and despite how important they are, not everybody has one or even if they have one, it might not be accurate or up to date. Uh, research shows that an estimated more than one in 10 uh, adults in the country, so that's more than 26 million people, lack any form of government issued photo ID. And uh, with respect to documents being out, out of date, even if you have one, um, you know there are a lot of different reasons that uh, an identity document might be out of date or inaccurate. We're obviously gonna to talk today about why that's relevant for trans people, um, but it's not just about trans people, right? Like you, there are many, many reasons you might need to update your ID. Like if you move, like I think I mentioned already, I just moved recently. The Census Bureau estimates that the average American moves 12 times or, or so in their lifetime. And that's a, um, excuse you, cat, sorry. And that's a, um, you know, every time you move, that's a, an address change. That's a kind of update you might need to make. And when it comes to changing your name, that's another reason you might need to update your ID. Uh, nearly 30% of all US adults, including over half of women, change their name in their life. This isn't just a question about trans people. Uh, it's a question about everyone, especially given how important identity documents are to being able to access all of these different parts of our life. Um, and not being able to have that ID, whether having one in the first place or getting a, a accurate or updated one can cause many harms for all of those different things that we just talked about, you know, being able to access a library or public transportation or opening a bank account or getting an apartment or applying for a job, let alone things like voting. So uh, the really, really important, and again, not just about trans folks though, that's what we're gonna be focusing on today. And in particular, we're gonna talk today about uh, identity document processes in these three different aspects. So uh, legally changing your name, updating the gender marker on your driver's license, and updating the gender marker on a birth certificate. So that's what we'll talk about today. Okay, so first talking about name changes. Um, you know, many transgender people, myself included, change, change their legal name to better reflect their gender identity. And state laws generally, generally allow people to do this as long as it's for a non-criminal purpose, like say you're trying to avoid credit card debt or that maybe you owe money on child support or something like that, uh, that you're not supposed to, so if it's for a quote unquote criminal reason, uh, you should be allowed to change your name in theory. But many states still have outdated and burdensome requirements that create really substantial barriers to folks uh, trying to get a legal name change. So just very broadly speaking, some of the, here are some of the steps in the process of legally changing your name. Um, in order to legally change your name, what you need is a, a court order saying, yes, you are allowed to do this and I, the judge, order that it be done. And in order to get that court order, it generally starts with filing a petition or some kind of paperwork with your local court where that's gonna happen, uh, where, that, where you're seeking that court order. And that's usually you know, where you live. Filing that petition usually costs money and usually not a trivial amount of money. And all of this is, again, assuming you're allowed and not just because of the quote unquote non-criminal purpose for changing the name, 
but also because many states have restrictions on people who have a criminal record uh, that either prevents them from changing their name at all or adds a lot of additional hoops and obstacles before they are allowed to change their name. And that's problematic for a number of reasons. Uh, including when we think about the disproportionate harms of the criminal justice system on communities of color and LGBTQ people. So I can talk more about that in detail, but just note that you know, this, this also assumes that you're even allowed to change your name in the first place. Um, once you file that petition, you also generally need, you, you need to set a date for the court hearing, assuming that they're gonna um, have a court hearing in person uh, or even on Zoom. Um, then there's a potential requirement to publish the notice of the hearing. So this is one of the most common and problematic requirements other than the uh, criminal restrictions. One of the most problematic requirements uh, for a legal name change is the requirement that you have to publicly post or publish notice of your legal name change effort in say like a local newspaper. And again, the idea is to, uh, so this, this provision, these requirements generally weren't created with transgender people in mind. Rather, they, the intention, in theory at least, was to try to make it harder for people to change their name if they were doing it for that criminal purpose. So again, let's say that you owe someone money or the government money. By requiring this publication of the effort to change your name, uh, it's giving people who might that you might owe money to or whatever the case might be um, a chance to hear that you're doing this and then to possibly like raise an objection or something like that. So it's not necessarily creative with trans people in mind, but as you might imagine, it creates a lot of problems, especially for trans people. So, you know, for example, my name change when I did this in Michigan was required to publish in the local newspaper. I want to say it was for at least two or three weeks in a row. And it makes you include, you know, here's my current legal name. Here's what I want to change it to. Here's the date that I'm having the court hearing. Uh, and that's like a big ad in the newspaper that you have to run. And that costs money itself. So the, the money is a problem. Publishing it, re being required to publish it is a problem because it can create this public record of your legal name change. And that can be an issue both for, you know, in the immediate time when you're, when it's running in the paper that that can, uh, out you to folks in the community, especially if you're maybe in a rural area where there's fewer folks, it might be more likely that that newspaper ad gets seen. Um, and we can talk about rural communities and the specific impacts of things like this uh, in Q&A if you're interested in, that's a really important area of research to me. But anyway, uh, so it can out folks. It can also, you know, even if it's not at the time when the newspaper ad is running, let's say a year from then you're applying for a job, they do a search on you and it comes up, the, the newspaper ad comes up in, in that search that can out you to an employer. So these requirements can be really problematic, not just because of the cost of paying to run that posting in a newspaper, but also because of the potential exposure to violence or harassment or discrimination. Um, okay, so then once the notice has been published, if it's required, then you have to actually go in person or to the, you have to attend the hearing, maybe it might be on Zoom now, but uh, that can be, you know, something you might have to take time off work to do, which could be another case of lost money or wages. Um, and then uh, hoping, ho hope that the judge actually grants your request, which isn't always guaranteed. Sometimes judges can say, no, I don't think you should do this because I don't think people should change their genders. There are many documented cases of that happening. Um, but assuming that your name change request is granted, then at that time, that begins basically like a whole nother, a whole new set of steps and processes that you have to do. So you've completed the legal name change at that point with respect to what the what the court is, how the, far the court is concerned. So you'll get the court order that says, yes, uh, I grant permission for this legal name change. It is so ordered. And then you need to basically buy certified copies of that court order to take with you now everywhere else that you need to go to change your name, like your bank account or the driver's license bureau or social security or anywhere else that you use your legal name. So anyway, as, as you can hopefully get the idea here, um, it's a complicated process. It can take a long time. Um, 
when I was doing it in Michigan, I didn't even include this here, but when I was doing it in Michigan, it also required a background check. Uh, so I had to get fingerprinted and send that information off to the FBI. Uh, so there's a lot of steps and a lot of money involved and a lot of time. So there's a lot of different aspects here. So let's look at uh, our quality maps and what um, try to condense some of this complexity into uh, something easier to, to digest. So I'm hoping, oh, sorry. Okay, so here's our quality map on name changes. And we, on the name change map, really focus on the publication requirement because of the impact it can have on uh, people's exposure to violence and discrimination. So if we start with the orange states, so these, are, these 10 states and four US territories, these are states that the law specifically requires that yes, you must publish an announcement about your name change in the local paper. So those states might still vary in um, how long you have to publish it or how frequently you have to publish it. Uh, this also doesn't show the cost uh, aspect of publishing, but it does just show which states require the publication notice. Um, and uh, yeah, so it focuses on, on the publication requirement. And then from there, moving up to the the light green states. So these 19 states are ones that either, it's not totally clear if they require publication um, or they do require it, but there's room in the law that allows individual courts to the discretion to say, okay, you don't need to publish this because it's for a gender related reason, or you don't need to publish this because uh, you say that it will, it, it might negatively impact your safety. And uh, so that's better than the states that just say, yes, you have to do this, no exceptions. Um, but it's still by leaving it up to the individual discretion or having these unclear requirements, that still means that someone in a given state like that might have a very different experience than someone in another part of that same state. So it's an improvement over just you have to do it no matter what, but it's still not as good as what we are ultimately hoping for, which are these dark green states that say, um, no, you, you are not required to publish a name change announcement. And I will note that some of these states, some of those dark green states, they either say, um, you don't have to do it for any kind of name change reason, or some of them say, you are not required to publish if it's specifically about a gender related transition. So this is one of those examples where on the map, we have this sort of top level view. Uh, and then in the citation sheet, there is more information about those gradations within a particular category. Um, but here we're generally trying to show, you know, this is the big, big picture landscape about this publication aspect in particular. <clears throat> and then, yeah, the caution icon uh, shows that what we were talking about before with the additional restrictions for folks with a criminal record. And again, in the citation sheets, there's more information about what those restrictions are. Okay, so that's um, our quality map on name changes focusing on the publication requirement. So then I wanna to turn to driver's licenses. Uh, so here we're gonna talk specifically about changing the gender marker on a driver's license. That is a distinct process from updating your name on a driver's license. Typically, once you get that legal name change, then you would go to the driver's license bureau and tell them you need to update your name. And there's a whole separate process for that. We're gonna talk instead about the gender marker itself, um, because gender markers are one of, having consistent gender markers on a person's identity document is one of the biggest um, things that can help protect trans folks from additional experiences of harassment or discrimination. So, you know, if you think about every time that you might have to show your driver's license, even like at a movie theater or at the bar, uh, at the grocery store, anytime you use your credit card, you need to match your ID, um, just any time that you might use your driver's license, if your driver's license doesn't show the gender marker that is accurate and consistent with your gender identity, every time that you are using that license, that's exposing you potentially to harassment or discrimination or mistreatment or denial of service. Um, so this is a really important aspect that we're going to focus on. <clears throat> so I want to say first, as uh, thinking about like where this sort of process lives or who's in control of this process. Uh, driver's, license, driver's license policies are typically overseen by the Secretary of State or that state's department or Bureau of Motor Vehicles, whatever you might call it. So 
if you're looking for more information about the process of driver's licenses and ID docs, um, like updating a driver's license specifically, these would be the first places I would go to look. Um, in addition to our resources, of course. Uh, but if if it's a something about driver's license that isn't about the gender marker, I would start with these places. Um, and when we think about the process to update the gender marker, there are a couple different things that we are asking about on our on our end. So first, are you even allowed to change the gender marker on your driver's license, or uh, is there at least a clear policy about how to do that? Then if it is allowed, what is the process and what all is required? Is there a form? Some states don't have a form. They just say, you know, show up and talk to somebody and we'll see how it goes. Uh, other states have a form that is uh, easy to use and really helpful and makes it much more streamlined. How much does this process cost? And then what is required uh, alongside whatever form you might have to submit? So there are some states, as we'll see in a minute, that in order for you to update the gender marker on your driver's license, you have to actually submit some kind of proof, quote unquote, <clears throat> excuse me, some kind of proof of your gender change. Uh, and what that might mean or is defined to mean can vary a lot. And as you might imagine, can be very invasive in some cases. Uh, some states also require what is generally called provider certification, which is basically like a doctor's note saying, yes, I'm a doctor and I agree that this person is a different gender and you should update their license. So if you think about like taking a doctor's note to school to, to have permission to do something, it's that same sort of thing, but a doctor's note to say what you know your own gender to be, which is problematic as well. Uh, and some, of, some states have uh, different definitions of what kind of providers you're allowed to get those notes from and that definition can make it easier or more difficult, depending on the case. We'll talk about this in a second. Um, by contrast, there's a, a the term self-attestation is really a gold standard here. And what that means is that I don't need anybody else's permission to say who I am. I can attest for myself who I am. So, and I'll show you an example of these kinds of forms in a minute. So those are states where you would not need any provider certification. Instead, all that you need is the self-attestation. I know that this is who I am. Uh, and then finally, independent of the process of like how easy or difficult is it to change the gender marker, what are the options? So not the process, but the options that are available to you once you do change the, the gender marker. And so here we're in particular, we're asking about the growing availability of states that allow you to mark X or some kind of non-binary or just something other than male or female on the, on the license. So these are some of the many questions we're asking when we think about driver's licenses. And here's some examples of the forms that I was telling you about, or a lack of form in this case. So this is from Louisiana. Uh, and what you can, so this is um, the policy in Louisiana because there is actually no form. And what it, so one thing to note here is like, okay, at least there is a policy. Not all states have a clear policy and that can be very confusing all by itself. Um, but there's no form. So you just have to basically go into the driver's license bureau and hope that they know what this policy is and that they will actually follow it. Um, it does require provider certification. As you can see here, this a medical statement signed by a physician stating that the applicant has undergone a successful gender change or reassignment. So you're requiring this medical statement and it's from a narrow set of providers. So it's only uh, allowed from a physician. Um, you'll see in a second, uh, uh, another form that'll give you a, a, I think you'll see an example of a contrast here in a second. Um, in addition, it also requires these burdensome, uh, it also has these burdensome requirements like a court order. Um, so there's a lot of steps that you have to go through just to change the gender marker on, on your driver's license, at least in this state. Here's a contrast from Illinois. Um, actually, this one is such a contrast, there's no provider attestation at all. So let me go back to this for a second. You can see here that this says signed by a physician. So that's what we consider a, a narrow set of providers. It's very medicalized. So it has to be a doctor. It has to be a physician. And in states where they have a similar policy and there's actually a form to go along with it, it usually requires them to put in like their medical uh, registration number. I, for, I forget the term, but the, the doctor's like official numbers that shows that they are registered licensed doctor in the state. 
Um, so it's a very narrow set of providers. In other states, there might be a broader, they, they might still require provider certification, but they accept that information from a broader range of people. So that might include a social worker or a psychologist or other folks. And that expansion of what providers count makes it easier uh, to meet this requirement. So we still don't like that there's provider certification required, but at least there's more options that folks can use. Um, and that can help eliminate some of the obstacles, especially if you think about folks who maybe don't have health insurance or it's harder for them to get to a doctor, maybe because they live in a rural area and there's fewer options available, that kind of thing. Okay, um, so this- uh, um, Logan. Yeah, please. Just to hop in, I just wanna play, we're running a little bit tight on time. Ooh, so thank I you. don't know if you maybe wanted to uh, yep. run, the, run the rest of this down a little bit fast. So like, <laughs> just to hop yes, in and let you. you know about that. Yep. I appreciate that so much. Um, okay, so quick, quickly on the gender form here, this is from Illinois. You see an absence of any information about doctors or anybody else. All you have to say is, I want this to be my gender uh, and that's it. And that's all it requires. One downside, there's no X option here. So here's our current map on driver's licenses. I know it's a lot to look at, but that's because this is a really complicated area of law. Um, so, I won't walk through this in detail, but just know we're generally using that same scale of orange is not good. The darker green it gets, the better. The star icons are the states that also allow you to have the non-binary option. Um, and again, in our citation sheet, there's a lot more information available about each one of these states, including usually a direct link to the form that you need to update your driver's license. Uh, and I'm sorry for running late, so I will um, keep moving. Um, birth certificates. Generally the same questions. It's typically even more difficult to do this. Um, and the Department of Vital Statistics in a state is where I would usually go for this information. Oh, wow, I didn't even realize how, just how late we're going. So I'm sorry for that. So I'll make sure these slides can get set around. Um, again, here's our equality maps. I also wanna mention the National Center for Transgender Equality has an identity document center that they have a lot of these same information set up um, and it tends to go into more detail in some places that we don't. So especially in states that don't have clear policies or written policies on identity documents, they tend to have more information from folks on the ground about what has worked, at least for some people in the state and examples of what you can try. So they're also a really great resource. Um, and then talking about how librarians can go or what, what y'all can do. Um, Larry, do you want me to just stop and we can just have a conversation? I'm really sorry for... Uh, running over. Oh, no, you're fine. Yeah, I think that's that's probably a good option. And for folks who can stick around, we'll maybe keep this going for another five or so minutes. And uh, again, we will circulate both the recording of this webinar. And uh, if Logan, you're down to circulate your slides as well, we can we can do that with our attendees. Yeah, um, I'm so sorry. Oh, yeah, no, hey, hey, it happens. There's a lot of really good information. And I want to definitely thank you for the really comprehensive rundown of all these options. You know, thinking about myself as also a trans person, thinking about how what my options might be here in Colorado, how I might want to approach that. This also has raised some considerations that I hadn't even thought of. <laughs> so thank you. Uh, and I do want to kind of leave things open to folks in, in the chat and folks in Q&A. If you have any questions, please, please do drop those. But maybe I want to open things up at to think about right off the top, what, were, what would be sort of your maybe like top two or three things that you would recommend librarians think about as ways to help trans patrons? And I'll also kind of add to the group uh, of, of considerations, what are some ways where we could help people who are researching uh, this policy landscape? How might we be best equipped to help those people? You want me to go first, or was that to the audience? Oh no, that's to you. Uh, yeah, okay. no, the way they use the Q and A works, they they go to you, and and I'm kind of the yeah. filter for that. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Just making sure. Um, yeah. So I think some of the the top things that librarians can be doing, and I mean a lot of it, y'all are already doing. Librarians are asked to fill so many critical social services that really should be the responsibility of the state. So you're already doing incredible work. Um, so it just would continue to do that. I think on uh, helping trans patrons in particular, there's just, this can be just so confusing and overwhelming. And um, we know uh, that trans folks are already more likely to face economic insecurity, 
uh, physical and mental health disparities, all kinds of things that make even just like navigating and finding this information more difficult in the first place. So being able to just help connect folks to resources to help simplify the process, um, that itself is, is a big help. Um, and I want to say, you know, you don't need to reinvent the wheel here. You know, MAP is a resource. The NCTE Document Center that I mentioned is a resource. And wherever you are, uh, there are state LGBTQ equality groups, local LGBTQ community centers, and a number of other organizations and networks like that that can be really helpful for partnering um, to, so again, that you don't have to reinvent the wheel. You can connect folks to what infrastructure is already there. And if you're thinking about programming or something, those infrastructures that already exist are great places to network, to host something like maybe you wanna do like a legal aid clinic to help trans patrons navigate this process or actually help get them connected to lawyers who will help them do it, like the nitty gritty of it. Yeah, thank you, absolutely. Uh, and I also do wanna say somebody dropped uh, into the chat to mention that uh, the process for changing your name in Massachusetts is even easier now. No publication, no in-person court appearance, just file and pay, which hell yeah, we love to hear that. That's great. <laughs> Yeah, so, you know, I think I, I'm not necessarily seeing anything coming in the chat. And like, that was kind of my core question because a lot of the questions that I kind of jotted down to myself yeah. as things go to you know, make sure that we had content, you ended up answering for, for us. So thank you again for such a comprehensive rundown of both the map resources and sort of all of the different considerations that go into that policy research, which I think is really helpful. So mm -hmm. thank you again. Uh, and for folks who are still here. Uh, again, this will be tossed in. We will record this, put it up on YouTube. Uh, there will be that uh, survey that goes out after this. So be sure to keep an eye out for, for that. Uh, and thank you again for joining us today. Thank you so much. And I apologize again about the timing. Um, please folks use my email or if I can help with anything about this or anything else, let me know. Um, thanks for the opportunity. Thank you, everyone.